Hello, gentle marketers. Welcome to episode 92 of the Gentle Business Revolution podcast, the show where we talk about marketing your business by disrupting the current marketing paradigm and changing it to a gentler approach, one that's based on empathy and kindness. As always, I'm Sarah Sinecroce. I'm the host on this show, and you know that you're in the right place if you are a heart-centered entrepreneur or change maker who is looking for a different, a better way to market your business. Or you might also be a marketing impact pioneer, so someone who's working in an organization, and probably you are in a company that does business for good, and so you're interested in also marketing differently and connecting with your customers in a different way. Today's conversation fits the fifth P of the gentle marketing mandala, the P that stands for pricing. And if you're a regular here by now, you know that I'm organizing the conversations around the seven P's of the gentle marketing mandala. And if you're new here, you may not know what I'm talking about, but you can download your one page marketing plan with the gentle marketing version of the seven P's of marketing at sarasanacroce.com forward slash one page the number one and then page and it comes with seven email prompts to really help you reflect on these different P's for your business. Before we dive in today allow me to tell you again about the next gentle business circle call on June 9th and invite you to join us for free. The circle is a hive mind of gentle marketers who get together on a monthly call to discuss gentle marketing and business questions. So imagine being authentically you, showing up as your true self in your marketing, not some prescribed version of who you should be in order to get customers. No more masks. Imagine doing the right thing. Your integrity really is everything and your clients love you for that and seek you out because they trust you to always tell them the truth. Imagine doing good and getting paid. Your clients resonate with you and tell you, it's you I want to work with. Imagine contributing to making this world a better place. You're growing a business that financially supports you, helps others, and makes an impact in this world. That's our common goal in the Gentle Business Circle. The Circle is an intimate and global community of gentle marketers. It's a calm space to hang out with like-minded, conscious entrepreneurs and help each other build our business and grow our impact. By exchanging knowledge, skills, and experiences, we develop our individual and collective competence, our cooperation and trust, and our professional identity. Our next circle call is coming up on Wednesday, June 9th. And if you'd like to try it out, you can check out the details at sarasanacroce.com forward slash circle and email me at sarah at sarasanacroce.com so that I can give you a free pass to join us. We'd love to have you on this month's circle. Okay, so today we talk all things numbers. And to do that, I reached out to Yero Magdalena because I heard her talk about shifting our relationship to numbers on her show. Yero Magdalena creates intentional websites and digital strategies for small, ethical, ethical businesses that are heartfelt and authentic. Yero's work centers sustainability and creates a bridge between big dreams and practical design and tech solutions. In addition to custom-built websites, she also offers business mentoring, facilitates the embodied business community, and hosts a podcast all about small business magic. In this episode, we discuss about our unease with numbers and where that comes from, how Yarrow handles the anxiety related to numbers and goals, the concept of an upper limit, the other side of growth, measuring and so much more. I think you'll really enjoy this one. It's a fresh perspective on anything number related. So let's dive in. Hi, Yero. So good to see you. I am so glad we got to connect for this episode. I look forward to it. Me too. I love talking to you and I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, we have quite the intense topic, but that doesn't <laughs> mean that we have to, you know, feel intense or anything. But it it is an intense topic, right? Numbers or any kind of measurement or 
yeah, kind of goal setting, all of these things, they're, they're usually like, they're emotional for people. It's, it's kind of similar with money here. We're talking about, you know, things that are measurable, tangible. And so they always kind of get more emotional. So why don't you kind of share with the audience how, because the, the topic of the, of this, of this episode is kind of like how do we can shift our relationship with, with numbers. And you uh, were talking about that on a recent episode on your podcast. And so I, I thought we'd start there and, and, you know, if you could just share with the audience how this even became a topic, like, like, mm-hmm. how do I change relationships to numbers? How did this all come about for you? Yeah, thank you. I think that's a beautiful question. I have, yeah, like you said, recorded a whole episode because I think there's so much to say. And I think where I'm standing right now, it feels really important that we really question in what ways having a relationship with numbers is useful. So daily obsessing, for example, daily checking for our likes on Instagram or for the things we think we need but don't yet have, I think it's not helpful. Mm -hmm. And I think it can feel like it's weighing us down in a way. It's maybe stifling creativity. And I also want to say that that this feeling of like openness to being playful with numbers and not taking them so serious is of course also coming from this place of relative privilege where I I feel pretty stable and steady in my business and I have a really clear and grounded understanding of what my numbers are and that means I can now let go a little bit more and don't need to look at them every single day so I have good systems in place where um, I track my income and my spending I also have an idea of my audience when I come up with an idea when I put it in the garden for example and I have an idea for a program or course I have a pretty good sense of how many spots I might easily fill with relatively little marketing based on the newsletter I have or the podcast listeners that I have and and I think yeah that took me a while to get there I've definitely also been in a place in my business where I was looking at the numbers every single day and I was putting a lot of thought and attention and energy into my likes for example or how many people would open my newsletter or how much money I was making and when I work with people I'm really interested in figuring out to what extent having really specific clearly in numbers to find goals is helpful and I think to some extent it always is I mean we run businesses because we want something more than a hobby right and that has to do with making money usually and it's good to be smart about numbers and to know them intimately I think but how can we take the anxiety out of that question I think that is that's good to ask yeah and I think you just mentioned that words that it has to do with is is the anxiety word right it's like how yeah how can we get away from that number anxiety and and maybe maybe first of all we can analyze a bit well why do we have anxiety around these things like why is that always such a topic for for people like I can understand the money but you know in terms of other things like numbers of likes, like Mm -hmm. there must be, I don't know if you've uh, kind of went deep into psychology, you know, kind of the reasons there, why is that, that we have such anxiety around those things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. Like with money, of course, there is a very existential element where we just have to, you know, ensure our survival on some level. And I think in a way it's, it's a compassionate thing to know that under capitalism, we grow up knowing that the meeting of our basic needs isn't a given, right? Like that's something that we really have to work for in our own way. And that can create a feeling of scarcity and anxiety. And when it comes to social media or other numbers like our newsletters, or for example, you know, how many requests for interviews we get a year. I think the the thing that we need to remember is that those platforms are really built for us to feel competitive and addictive to them. And that's not a character flaw in ourselves. I really enjoyed Mm. watching the documentary, The Social Dilemma several times and really sitting with what was presented there and thinking about how it has made me feel to be absolutely new six years ago in business and look around myself and see all these people with the big numbers and, you know, massive profiles and 
seeing that they had so much engagement and thinking that what they had to say was inherently more valuable because more people were hearing it. Right. And I think that takes time of like untangling that and finding our own voice and also just the confidence and the knowing to say, you know, I think maybe what I want to do isn't for everyone. Maybe it's not going to reach millions of people, but actually it's just so close to my heart. And I'm happy to just talk to people who are my people who want to hear about what I have to say, even if it's not mainstream or if it's not for everyone. And I think I hate the word where they use the word authenticity because it's so overused but I think really and, and especially now in the pandemic in this past year if we really sit down and we're asking ourselves what we're attracted to in other people like why do we work with people or buy something from someone it's probably because they spoke to us in a deeper way and I think what most of us are craving is connection and intimacy a feeling of feeling seen and heard and understood and cared for. And those are not experiences that you can create by being someone you're not and trying to play the numbers game. And that's easier said than done. I think that this is something that comes with experimentation and, and freedom and playfulness. And for me in the past few years, that's been like a spiral journal almost, I would say in the beginning where I, I knew that what I just said was true on some level, but I didn't really feel it in my body, you know, like I was like, well, that's good for other people to say, but if I really said out loud how anxious I am right now starting out or how I feel like such an imposter because I don't have 20 certificates, you know, who's gonna want to work with me? And I think so, so each step towards telling more of the truth and what felt true for me at the time really got me super lovely feedback and then grew my confidence more confidence more to say even more about what I was really feeling and thinking and it kind of like grew from there and now I feel liberated in some ways I mean I definitely still edit my brush my hair before this interview <laughs> <laughs> and you know I think that you know there's a part of that that will always be there but I feel much more free and how I express myself and I'm really grateful for that and I think that's a measure of success for me as well because I know we're going to think more about goals but that's just a nice goal to have to feel like you can be yourself in your business and really not spend so much time worrying about what other people think because it's a big time and energy drain that could go into other ideas or dreams that you have. Wow there's a lot into what you just uh, said and, and you know for you it was just like you know these sentences one after the other but the, I think like every one of them had like so much meaning so I want to go back into a couple of things first of all kind of your definition of success because I talk about that in the gentle marketing revolution book as well I think that that is key so I'll bookmark that then the other thing also that you mentioned is this idea of not having uh, to have this, you know, giant business that for the last decade or even 15 years, that's kind of what we've been shown. That's the mainstream idea of success. You have to have, you know, the business like Amy Porterfield or, or, or the like, right? Uh, what's the other one? Forleo, Marie Forleo. Like these are kind of the, 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 the role models that we've been shown. And while, you know, I'm sure they have a really good business, it is true that the connection there is, is definitely not as intimate as, you know, a, a business that is really built on uniqueness. So mm -hmm. I, I think there's, there's a lot to that there, like where we really first think about who we are and what makes us happy and, and then go into, and into, you know, what kind of clients would be a good fit for us, where it seems like before it, it was more like, okay, this is my expertise. Here's my program. And now let me talk to everybody who needs that program. So it was a, a very different approach. I'm not saying that you know, that didn't work. It worked uh, for a while, but you're right now, people, uh, especially after the pandemic, they just, they just want different things. Values have changed 
And like you said, we want to be heard and seen. And, and that is more difficult. Like I, I have memories of these webinars that we would all participate in. And then, and then, you know, the host would say, oh, there's like thousands of people. And, you know, this person is saying this and the, thank you all for joining. And, <laughs> and it felt like you were just a number to them, right? And so I think that's what's changing as well. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, numbers is good and lots of people, you know, power to you, but maybe just maybe that's not what everybody wants. And even that's not necessarily what the customer wants. I know that I'm in a, a, a program that kind of started out small and it was, it was like this, this mastermind type of thing, a community. And, and, and then after a while, the host was saying, so now I'm going to grow this thing and, you know, make it huge. And, and all of us who were there were like, really? Like, we're fine. We don't need more people, right? So it's, it's important also to think, well, what does your client want? They don't want necessarily for it to be huge. They don't I don't think they judge you if they see that there's only 10 people in your community. Mm -hmm. uh, that used to be maybe the case, but I just don't think it, it's like that anymore. Mm -hmm. so, so let me ask you about this idea of definition of success. So you already kind of hinted at it, but mm -hmm. what is your definition of success? How do you define it? Mm. <laughs> I mean, it shifts as well, right? I'm super up for giving you an answer today. And I think a year from now, it might be different again. And I'm open to that. That's okay. But I feel at the moment, I feel emphasis on resilience, you know, having seen this past year, how it unexpectedly it had unfolded. And to know that I was not abandoning myself or my business or my ideas that I was quite steady through it. That really means a lot to me. And that's a measure of success, I think. Mm -hmm. I feel adaptable. I find that even though things have been stressful and difficult at times, I still came up with ideas that were exciting to me and other people. That feels really good. And I feel peaceful most days. And maybe that sounds like boring hippie shit. I don't know, <laughs> but, but I'll expand on that a little bit more. So when I was starting out six years ago, I did Marie Folio's B school, actually, which is funny that you just <laughs> mentioned her. Okay. And I had no idea exactly what I was going to do. I had just done an MA in creative media. I loved working creatively, but I was mostly freelancing as an editor and a translator from English to German. And I was very, really making very little money with that and living in the south of England, which was quite expensive. I mean, still is. And so I just didn't really, I mean, and I loved working from home, but I didn't really have perspective in that position. There was really nowhere to go from there. The working conditions for the agency that I was working for weren't great. And I knew I didn't want to go back into employment. I had several years of working in different e-commerce companies under my belt. And that was a great experience in my 20s, but it wasn't my future. Mm -hmm. And I joined B-School just kind of with the sense of I want to work for, for myself, but I really don't know what that looks like yet. And honestly, I couldn't even really afford it. I put it on my credit card. I want to just be super transparent there. And being in that space really opened my eyes to what was possible online. And it's it's not that I loved everything about it. You know, every, you know, the, Marie Forleo, his work is amazing in many ways, but not all of it was really something that spoke to my heart in some ways. But I was in this massive Facebook group where I was really a number, you know, I think there were like 3000 people at the time mm -hmm. and it's like 20,000 now. So it's gone really big. And what I was seeing around me was that the thing that people most struggled to implement was getting a WordPress site up. And I hadn't officially trained as a web designer in any way, but I had made websites since I was a teenager. So at that point, that had been more than 10 years, plenty more. And so I really just kind of was in the situation of feeling deeply unhappy with the way I had been working. I, I needed to make more of an income. I knew I wanted to work for myself. And I looked around myself and I saw this problem that people were having. So I very pragmatically decided to train myself as a web designer and spent my first year really doing late nights and weekends. I was such a social hermit, like no, none of my friends ever 
saw me that year <laughs> very much. I was just home with my dog or in the garden, but I, I taught myself how to make beautiful websites and I just really found so much freedom and creative expression in that work. And it was fairly easy to get that going because it was such a tangible problem for people. It was easy to approach them and say, hey, look, I see you're struggling to make this work for yourself. You know, why don't you hire someone to help you? And I think for someone starting out in a similar situation, that's something I really recommend actually to speak to people's problems and see if there's something that's really easy to you that maybe is harder for other people. And it's just such a great place to start. So this is just a kind of the background to what I'm about to say about what success looks like for me now. I, I broke my leg on New Year's Eve and I had to be in hospital for 10 days, a quite complicated surgery. And I was told that I wouldn't be walking for four to six months. So it was quite a big life change. And in the first few months this year, I really had to step back from a lot of the work that I had kind of come to find quite a normal part of my week. And I drastically lowered my hours and, and I found that it didn't affect my business in the way I had previously worried it would. I actually found that so many things became much easier because they had to. I left social media for good, for example. I completely deleted my Instagram profile just because it didn't feel like a rewarding you know, way to spend my time and build my business. And that was totally okay because I have two podcasts I have a newsletter that I've been building for years I run small workshops with people so in 2018 and 19 for example I did free monthly tech workshops that people could just come to and there were usually like 20 people in a room and for many people that would not be enough they would say like oh I'm not you know I'm not putting on a bra for 20 people <laughs> but actually it has worked so well for me because it has built trust it gave me confidence and how I teach and what I teach and how I connect with people and it has brought this whole like wave after little wave of one-on-one -on -one clients that wanted to work with me because they had known me and they had experienced me in some way that didn't make them feel like a number. So to come back to your question, I think looking back now and on how I've built my business over the years and how I've prioritized intimacy and connection and, and just what felt right to me at the time rather than just numbers now made me feel like, wow, you know, something big like a broken neck can happen and it's not the end of my world at all. I'm actually okay. And that, you know, who knows what life will bring. Maybe there'll be heartbreaks or burned down houses. And, and I don't wish that for myself and anyone. <laughs> no, but... I don't wish that for you either. <laughs> <laughs> but it just feels peaceful to feel my own resilience, you know, and to know that I was okay and I will be okay. And I'm still a creative person who's making enough money working with great people. And yeah. I don't know what else I could wish for. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. And, and, and I'm really impressed that you also just shut down your Instagram. That really mm -hmm. is also, you know, proof that this whole kind of hustle mentality, we can just literally say, I'm done. You know, mm -hmm. we can if we have built the, 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 the structure around our business. Uh, clearly it helps, you know, starting out where we're not saying it doesn't, but I think you can also build a business uh, without Instagram or without LinkedIn. And, and I help my clients really with focus. And so it, one of the things is always when we talk about the, the, in the gentle marketing superpower sessions, like, well, find the one platform Yes, where your clients hang out, but also that brings you joy mm -hmm. that you actually enjoy being on, you know, like for me, for example, Facebook is just not the platform I want to be. I don't even have an Instagram account. So, so yeah, be selective so that it, it feels good. And, and, and even on that one platform, because I, I, in my other business with LinkedIn, people always, you know, the one thing that they come to me for at the beginning is like, how can I get more reach? How can mm -hmm. I get more engagement? And I always tell them, it's not about the numbers. It's like mm -hmm. you you only get one view on this post and it's the right kind of person who sees it, that's enough. Mm -hmm. But in our heads, yeah, we, you know, it's, it's really, I think it's that it, it's this acceptance or, you know, kind of this 
this you know, the inner child that needs to be loved somehow on, on that social mm -hmm. level, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what it has to do with as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I totally agree with that, yes. The, the other thing you also talked about on that episode, and we'll link to that on your, on your podcast, even if it will be maybe a bit repetitive, because I literally went through it. I'm like, oh, this is good. Oh, we need to talk about this. <laughs> so the other thing you, you mentioned was an upper limit. Mm -hmm. And again, that's very kind of counterintuitive or you know, controversial. People always talk about you know, the sky's the limit and you can scale your business. And, you know, especially in, in this kind of new age belief of manifesting. So, so what was your, how did you get to this idea of having an upper limit? And, and yeah, didn't you also have like, maybe also your own resistance to it because of the, these other mm -hmm. kind of communities who believe mm -hmm. in no limits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for asking and being open to having a controversial conversation yeah. because I know it is controversial. And I think before I say anything, I really want to say like, if what I'm about to say doesn't resonate with people, that's totally okay. I think we all come to conversations around money from really different places and we'll all have to make peace with it in our own way. Right. Sure. And so I'll start with my frustration, I guess. And I've been around the self-help, self-development world for many years, as many of us have. And I think what bumped me was this idea that success should look like, look like the same thing for all of us. So when people teach about money specifically in their programs, what I've often seen is that they would, you know, post on Instagram of them flying first class or having several cars or having a massive house with lots of bedrooms. And I love the good life as well you know like I love good food and going to see new places and just having a lovely time with people but I think there's an element of almost mindless wealth accumulation that isn't sustainable for the planet and I, I also inherently think deep down that my energy my time isn't worth more than someone else's and I think that is in a way very political right you know like I think we we get paid different things but I think as a society, we have more questions to ask around why that is and if it's really a fair system to have that maybe some, you know, some CEOs earn like 500 times what the cleaner in their company might earn, for example. And I also think we have questions to ask around where our happiness is coming from, like is having three, three spare bedrooms that you need to heat and care for really, really deep down making you happy or is that just like you said earlier, maybe speaking to a younger part of ourselves that maybe didn't feel accepted, that still feels like we have something to prove, to prove in a very outwardly way that we have made it or that we're worthy of the work that we're doing. And then another question is like, you know, what would happen if all of us were flying first class all the time around the planet? It's, it's not sustainable. We can't afford that. And I think we really need to be more fair with how we distribute resources. Okay, so that's my little rant on why I was frustrated with this idea. And so I was thinking then on the flip side, I do think that we have limits to our success that we need to look at. So for me, for example, if I'm really honest with myself, there are people from my past, maybe from a, being a teenager or even in primary school where I worry that they would now look at my website and think, oh my God, you know, like who has this person become? Or like, <laughs> I have that sometimes too. Right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Or even an ex-partner or a friend we used to have or a teacher, you know, I think each of us has a story of who they don't want to see our success. And there's something that's making us nervous around being seen doing beautiful things that are reaching a lot of people in the world you know no one wants to know that people are talking behind their bags or maybe wondering why we are successful for example I think very often these fears are unfounded and they're just old wounds and it's okay to be gentle with that and to just accept that maybe sometimes it's human to feel that way and I think also that they can really stand in the way of how we're expressing ourselves so I work sometimes with people who want to start a podcast who have huge hesitations around sharing their voice in that way or being seen in this way. 
And, and it's important to think about that. So I'm really not rejecting the idea of working with our upper limits as a blank statement, right? I think there's really valuable work to do there. But like I said, I think I have questions around whether we all need to fly first class and have massive houses. And in my podcast episode, I shared that I'm actually embracing the idea of an upper limit for myself because I found that there's real peace or like a sense of just contentment to be like, you know what, if this is all there will ever be in my business, I'm fine. I'm super lucky. I mean, we are so privileged. I look, live in a lovely home with a small garden. I have food that I'm really enjoying. I mean, I was going to say I have lovely friends. I would love to see them <laughs> right now. <laughs> soon. That, that is soon. Yeah, exactly. So I still have wishes, of course, but I'm not really, really deep down lacking something. And I just know that when I'm in a place of feeling there's always the next step to take where, and I have done that, you know, I celebrate my business birthday on the 1st of March each year, for example. And there have definitely been years where this anniversary just kind of passed by and I didn't really pause to take stock and to think about what I had done that past year and to really celebrate and honor that. And I think that's such a shame because, I then always rush on to the next thing and think that I need to be in constant growth when actually this period of time where the, the first quarter of this year where I was mainly just focusing on healing my leg, there was no time for growth and it was totally okay to not bring out a new thing or to grow my newsletter list massively. I was just, you know, getting by for a moment and I think that's liberating and I also chose a fairly simple life for myself, you know, being someone who has known financial anxiety. I, I bought this home last summer. It's in a small town on the east coast of Scotland. I can travel. I'm looking actually over the bridge out of my window here. I can travel to both Edinburgh and Glasgow really easily for an afternoon, but I'm not living right in the city anymore. And to me, that's been a process of really asking who I am. And even before the pandemic, I wasn't going out for dinner three times a night, a week, if, you know, in the city or going to the movies or to the theater all the time I love these things sometimes but I just really don't need to live in a hip neighborhood I need to live by the woods and by a nice lake and the beach and so this town that I chose here is really beautiful but it's not cool in a conventional sense it's, it's <laughs> affordable and this home that I bought is it has cost me a fraction of what I would have paid in the city my mortgage is really really small and I don't have a ton of space I have just enough for myself for my books, uh, for my docs, for all my house plans, but I really can't stuff my spare rooms, which are not existing, <laughs> with, with things, you know, I have Marie Kondo my house a few times, I'm really deeply decluttered, and now that everything that I surround myself, I really truly love, and it brings me joy, and it's very intentional, and so both with this home and with my business, I feel so much possibility and openness to growth. I have so many ideas that, of what I would do. And there's a lot that I would love to do in my garden. I would love to install solar panels on my roof, but I'm also quite content. And I think if this is all that is in the next 20, 30 years, that is plenty as well. And it's nice. Contentment to is, is a great yeah. place to be. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we, I think we sometimes, yeah, underestimate the, the the worth of contentment mm -hmm. because we all, always talk about happiness but mm -hmm. it feels like you know yes there's happy moments of mm -hmm. course hopefully in every day but contentment that that's what you refer to as this mm -hmm. state of peace right mm -hmm. where you're just like yeah it's ease you know there's mm -hmm. a lot of ease there's a lot of spaciousness and and and, and yeah I I totally agree with you there's 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 this idea, even in entrepreneurship, just like we have with the corporate world, that there's always the next thing, right? Mm -hmm. Once you, if you're not at six figures, well, you got to hit fix six mm -hmm. figures first. And then once you hit six figures, well, you now you have to go mid six figures. Mm -hmm. That's a new term. And then it's seven and then it's eight. And it's like, well, where does it ever stop? Mm -hmm. And and so you're basically always going to be hustling to the next mm -hmm. step. So I totally agree with you that it's important that we analyze our enough and 
that kind of goes together, I guess, with the definition of success. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, you talked about your lifestyle, very important. The only thing that I kind of was thinking at the back of my head, I'm like, well, in this case, we're only thinking about ourselves. Mm -hmm. What I like when, you know, people who, who make these big six, seven figure, eight figure figures, I like to see when they give back, mm -hmm. right? You don't like, there's not all of them, obviously, who do that. Mm -hmm. But the ones that do, I'm like, well, then you take it to another level, because mm -hmm. then you're not only looking out for yourself, Mm -hmm. Maybe at a certain, I think at a certain stage, the flywheel just takes off mm -hmm. and money just, you know, it just comes easy in a mm -hmm. way. It's, it's, there's no much, no more struggle and you don't even have to have a big team. Mm -hmm. And so if at that level, you're then thinking, okay, now I have enough for myself, more than enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how do I give back now right mm -hmm. so that to me is also part of I guess a sustainable business because mm -hmm. then you're at that stage where it's like well you know I, I can give back but it doesn't mean that all of us have to you know work mm -hmm. towards that I, I agree mm -hmm. with you totally yeah that's super interesting I feel the same I love seeing people share their resources and and giving back and redistributing wealth essentially and I think that's in a way also a beautiful upper limit where they say well I've ha I just have enough for myself now and I'm gonna share that with the um, courses that I really believe in I mean I'm not in that place right now of like middle six figures so I don't have to ask myself that question but I'm also thinking about how I get to show up in my community so I'm also noticing that now that I've stepped out of this hustle and this always wanting more, I have a much better friend or, you know, a much better volunteer in my community. And I can be generous in ways that go beyond money sometimes. And money yeah. absolutely is a part of that and is really important. But I think people, we can be generous in lots of different ways. And I love... That's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, you can give back time as well. It doesn't always have to be money, right? Yeah, you can yeah. Give back time. So good. Yeah, I like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else did I want to talk about? Yeah, the, the kind of the maybe shifting gears a little bit and talk more about this social media aspect. Mm -hmm. So you, you brought it up, you closed down your Instagram mm -hmm. and kind of like what are other ways that you helped you shift your perspective about these social media numbers and, mm -hmm. and always thinking big like there's so many things for me it was just recently first I, I launched a book on kickstarter mm -hmm. and so you know really being mindful of not always thinking you know I have to make like this huge thing on kickstarter and yet again everywhere you look that's what they want to sell you that's like mm -hmm. this is what you do same thing then with the book launch you know believing and trusting that this is, you know, slow and steady kind of thing. And it, it doesn't mean you have to hit all these big bestseller lists and all of that. So, so what has helped you kind of shifting your perspective about that? Interesting. It was actually looking at numbers really specifically in the, in the beginning. I think I had felt resentment around the time I was spending on social media for a couple of years. And I took a six month break in 2009. So that was before the pandemic in a different yeah. world, basically. <laughs> and I thought, you know, people like Clarissa Pinkula Estes, who are of a different generation, they never had to be on social media and they still have these beautiful, thriving businesses with many books and success in their own way. Like, why do I have to do it? Yeah. <laughs> and and I also want to say that for a long time, for many years, actually, I really enjoyed it. I think in the beginning, Instagram was super fun. We still had a chronological feed so that every time you shared, people would actually see it. It wasn't as competitive. You didn't have to think so much about beating the algorithm and air quotes. Mm -hmm. So it just felt a lot more playful for me. And I really enjoyed expressing myself visually. But I think there came a time where it was just too much, like the pressure to always be sharing of myself to not really be allowed privacy in a way to feel like I had to be hashtag authentic and, <laughs> and, and just, you know, have be this constant screen, stream of, of free content, basically. And so I took this six-month break. It was totally fine for my business. 
And before I did, and this is where the numbers came in, I used an app called Zenscreen. And so I tracked how much time I was spending on Instagram. And in 2019, in the summer, that was 10 hours a week, which was absolutely shocking. And it was really blowing my mind. And a big chunk of that time will be spent on trains or buses, probably. So it would be queuing somewhere or being on public transport and just kind of mindlessly scrolling through. I wasn't working on Instagram 10 hours a week, but it was still a lot of time. And I was looking at my life and thinking like, actually, I there's so much I would love to do and have more time for. Like I learned to weave that year, for example, and I spent more time talking on the phone with my friends and sending long voice messages. And so I just did this experiment and and thought I really want these 10 hours back. And I wonder what would happen if I spend four of these hours on other work in my business and six just for myself. And and so I podcasted more. I wrote a whole series of zines. I wrote a book in spring last year. I reconnected with other people in a deeper, more meaningful way. And it was really great. And then the pandemic hit and I came back because I just wanted to scream into the void with other people and see what everyone's up to. I just wanted to see what my friends were eating and their pads and that kind of <laughs> yeah. stuff. And it was helpful. And then around the, the winter solstice last year, 2020, I was just going to go on another break. So I deactivated my account and I thought I'll just take a three week break. And then after a week, I noticed that actually my attention span really shifted. I was sinking much deeper into books again. I was reading, you know, some books I really enjoyed in two days, or I was having longer conversations or was watching a movie without fiddling with my phone at the same time, which is, I mean, this just blows my mind that this is what we've come to see as normal, right? Mm -hmm. And I was then looking at my numbers again, not judging myself for how much time I had spent on Instagram that year because it was a challenging year. And I did what felt comforting to me at the time. Right. But I looked at how effective it was for my business. So I had this little profile link that you click and it would la land you on this landing page on my website that had all my different offerings. And I tracked that on average, I was getting 100 clicks a month. And I was just really thinking about whether those 100 clicks are worth that much time and energy for me and really said no to that. And I think there are so many reasons for being on Instagram or another platform that are really good, like making connections with people, you know, seeing what people are questioning or talking about, what they're struggling with, hearing their stories, being inspired, doing market research. And that isn't so much specifically about numbers, but really at the end of the day, you want people with, to engage with what you have to offer. And out of 100 clicks, you might only have five or 10 at most that actually actually decide to work with you mm -hmm. and that to me was not proportionate to the time and energy I was investing in Instagram so just purely from that kind of numbers business perspective it was not making sense for my business so I deleted the profile completely I watched the social dilemma again <laughs> I thought I thought about how I felt about Facebook and how it's run and what it you know what its values are and I came up with really creative ideas that I, you know, want to come back to in my business. So I'm running free workshops every month again. That's just one hour of my time. Let's say two with preparation, but it's so much fun. And it honestly does way more for my enjoyment and my expression and my confidence and, and the numbers that I have in my business and the amount of people that sign up to work with me than Instagram ever has. So mm. I really love indie media and doing it in our own way. What I love about the way you talk about numbers is, is that it's not like, you know, me, for example, who is like, I don't want anything to do with numbers anymore. Like, you know, I, I actually have an aversion to, to numbers almost where you're like, well, let's see what the numbers say, you know, like, let's look at them. And yes, I do convince myself every now and then to go in and check my <laughs> Google analytics and things like that. But but yeah, it makes so much sense to actually go, wait a minute, is this a smart move to spend, you know, 10 hours on something that brings me a hundred clicks? Like, it's just, yeah, there's, there's just no, it's not proportional where, mm -hmm. it, you know, when you put out your podcast, not only does it make you feel good, but mm -hmm. people actually hear you, they hear a conversation, there's like this different kind of relationship that that forms much more so than yeah just seeing a, a thing on on Instagram or or for, for for me it's often LinkedIn where now I I feel 
you know, almost guilty sometimes that I'm not posting enough. Mm -hmm. Uh, But at the same time, like, it's nice. And yes, you feel loved when all these people comment. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, you know, yeah, are the clicks really worth it? And, Mm -hmm. And are they yeah turning into the right kind of clicks as well mm-hmm. that's that's also the question so yeah yeah there's so much kind of really it comes back to focus like focus on the things that a you enjoy but b also that give you the biggest return on investment because mm-hmm. otherwise why do them i often refer to a trance right so if we're not paying attention to these things then yeah, we can live years and years in this trance of thinking that's just how it is in business. That's what I have to do. Mm-hmm. But it's not. You have a choice. And, and, and yeah, you, you shared that you have this choice to just step out of it and say, I'm not doing that anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's wonderful. I, I see the time and uh, we, we could <laughs> talk more. I have many more things on my, on my list, but I, I want to just maybe ask you, like what else uh, comes up for you when you talk about mainly also maybe this idea of, you know, how you nurture yourself. Like when you do have these doubts of, you know, feeling not liked enough or, or there's not, you know, there's not enough. How do you give yourself back that kind of self-nurturing and say, no, but I am enough and I can do it my way. Mm-hmm. comes up for you such a good question I think one thing that really helps me is having a feedback folder so I take a screenshot or I collect all the emails or feedback that I receive and I often invite people to reach out and you know tell me how they've been feeling or what they're thinking or what questions they have so in a moment of doubt that's so lovely to dive into just kind of pick an email at random from my little folder and read through that and know that I've made a difference to someone in some way I love that And then I think it's really also about getting to know yourself. So I, for example, I'm such an introvert. I don't, I don't need to be in groups all the time, Mm -hmm. but, and and I need a lot of time by myself to really replenish and be in my garden or read or cook some nice food. And in the beginning, I thought that meant I shouldn't hold group spaces, for example, or that that would maybe not come naturally to me. And I really allowed myself to play with that. And I found that I actually love running group workshops and facilitate groups. And that actually it's, for me, it's more about the amount of time I spend on Zoom each month. And I have really dramatically lowered that. And I'm really intentional with the time that I am on Zoom now. And that's been really helpful. So I think our self-care or self-nourishment looks so different from everyone else. So for me, the first step is always to really get to know myself and how where I'm at in any given you know point in time and to think about what would be feeling good for me and to give myself that freedom to let it look different to someone else's freedom Mm. and I think when the anxiety is more around numbers and money then I really enjoy having a list of things that I can do so I think the worst feeling with that is feeling like you're anxious about money but you're also stuck about what to do and so I really like to remind myself that there's always everyday small things that I can do that will maybe share something that I've made so maybe that's something like sending a newsletter or reaching out or being active in someone else's mighty network or just answering a question or you know recording a solo episode which sometimes you know comes quite spontaneously and so I feel like I'm always in a flow and that keeps me connected with a feeling of abundance and possibility. So I'm trying to not get too tense and too stuck in this feeling of like, oh, I don't know exactly what is next. Yeah. You speak our language, Yero, that's for (laughs) sure. (laughs) I love it. Yeah, it's so much about going back to who you are and, you know, how you can allow yourself to, to be different. So, yay. Please do tell our listeners where they can find out more about you and also mention the name of your podcast again. Yeah, sure. So the podcast is called The Embodied Business Podcast. And my business is at yarrowdigital.com. And this is where people can sign up for the free monthly workshops. 
I have a workbook called Our Business as uh, Our Bodies as an Authentic Business Mentor that I also enjoy sharing. And then I have another business which is more about reconnecting with nature and rituals um, and my writing, which is at yaromagdalena.com. Wonderful. I, I haven't you. seen that one yet, so I have to go <laughs> and look at that. I always ask a last question, and that is, what are you grateful for today or this week or this month? Ooh, I'm really grateful to learn to walk again. That's been big. I'm really grateful for being able to have these kinds of conversations like this one with you. I'm so happy that we have this technology and mm -hmm. I keep thinking about how different this past year would have been without the internet and being able to connect in this way at least. Yeah. So that means a lot to me and I'm grateful for it becoming spring and things popping up in my garden. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time, Yero. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Yero and heard some new ways to think about your numbers, goals, and measuring. You'll find the show notes of this episode with further links at sarasanacroce.com gbr92. Please also check out Yarrow's website at yarrowdigital.com. That's Y-A-R-R-O-W, digital.com. And her podcast is at yarrowdigital.com forward slash podcast. Also, don't, don't forget to send me an email to sarah at sarasanacroce.com if you'd like to join us for free on this month's Circle Call on June 9th. It takes place at uh, 5 p.m. my time in Switzerland, and that is 11 a.m. Eastern. Next week's episode is about the P of promotion of the Gentle Marketing Mandala, and I'm talking to Michelle Mazur, and we're talking about the power of three-word rebellions. So make sure to tune back in next week. In the meantime, let's be the change we want to see in the world. Speak soon.